definition of absolute truth in itself, if you just look it up, it says something that is true at all times in all places. Wow. Something that is true at all times in all places. So that kind of butts up the current movement that we're in within our nation now, the progressive movement. It's just like, well, I know, and this has been going on for centuries, but it seems to be more magnified now, more prevalent now within our nation, and even in the world, not just our nation. But it's just like, well, we know that this was all good 100 years ago or even 50 years ago, but, you know, we've progressed. Basically what they're saying when they say that is they're buying into the, the evolution thought is we've evolved so we don't do that anymore it doesn't apply anymore it, it can't it, it, it can't be that way anymore well what they're really saying there is they're not talking about absolute truth they're talking about relative truth relative truth is based upon the current circumstance and your and it also means that your truth could be different based uh, than my truth because my truth is based upon my life, what I do, how I function, where I go, what I think is real, what I think is truthful. And it may not be the same thing that you think is truthful, but we can all live together and be in peace. Well, it don't work that way. God knew that with the children of Israel. He told them very often, in the beginning, he told them, separate yourself from the other peoples. Separate yourself from the other nations. Don't contaminate yourself is basically what I was saying. He said, don't marry with them. Don't, don't, don't. And now we can take that and run an addiction and we can think, well, does that mean that we don't have any association with the world? No, how do you get them saved if you don't have association with them? How do you get them saved if you don't talk to them and share Jesus with them? So we can take anything in the word of God and just run it into a ditch. And we're really good at running things into a ditch. Let's just be honest. The church is really good at running things into the ditch. We hear a truth, we know it's absolute, but we absolute it into the ditch and don't see the whole purpose. I mean, that's why Jesus dealt with the Pharisees the way he dealt with them. They, they tried to take the law, and it was so rule-oriented without the love of God or without the character of God or without the nature of God involved in it that they were running it into a ditch and they tried to even nail Jesus with it. But we all know that they couldn't nail Jesus with it. Jesus operated in the absolute truth because absolute truth cannot be uh, done or absolute truth cannot be shown to the world without love. I said it can't be done without love. See, if you're demonstrating absolute truth, if you're speaking absolute truth, it'll be seasoned with grace, it'll be seasoned with love. And it'll be more easily accepted or more palatable, if you could say it that way. It's just like, you know, that's why the Bible says, you know, that, that we're the salt of the earth. Put a little bit of salt on the truth. And some be like, Hey, that tastes good. Yeah. You know, add a little salt to it. Just, just don't cook it up all bland, meaning just don't, just don't open up your Bible and quote a scripture and throw it in their face and say, here, eat this. No, they don't want to eat it. You may have to put a little caramel syrup on it. A little drizzle. Come on. But to make the truth palatable, I mean, how, many of you in here could probably testify that you heard truth. I know I heard truth for several years, a number of years before I accepted Christ. But the way it was presented to me, at least it would appear at the time, the way it was presented to me, it wasn't palatable. It wasn't until it was presented to me in such a way that it was like, wow, this Jesus, he's a good thing. It's a good thing to accept Jesus. He's got my best interest at hand. And his word, his truth, his life shows me who I am. You see, that's what truth does. Truth shows you who you are. 
That's why it's important to speak the truth. That's why it's important to declare the truth. Because truth shows you who you are. If you contradict truth, if you say something other than truth, that means you're saying something other than what God says about you. That's why it's important to be absolute about the truth. Another definition for absolute truth is it's always true no matter what the circumstance. It is a fact that cannot be changed. It is a fact that cannot be changed. In Malachi chapter 3 and verse 6, God says, he's speaking to the children of Israel, he says, For I am the Lord, I do not change. I am the Lord, I do not change. If you've got your Bibles with you, you can turn over to Titus. The book of Titus. Another place where God is speaking through the Apostle Paul here in the book of Titus, talking about truth. In Titus chapter 1, verse 1 or 2, it says, This letter is for Paul, a slave of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ. I have been sent to bring faith to those God has chosen and to teach them to know the truth that shows them to live godly lives. This truth gives them the confidence of eternal life. Once again, there it is, the eternal life. This truth, absolute truth, gives you the confidence of eternal life. Or if you could say it gives you the truth of the God kind of life. Which God promised them before the world began, and, the, and he cannot lie. He, God, cannot lie. Aren't you glad that God can't lie? Aren't you glad that, that the word of God is foundation. It's not a shaky foundation. It's not a changing word. I don't know about you, but I've been around people before that they're saying one thing one day, and then a week or two weeks or a month or whatever, all of a sudden they're saying something different. And, and that relationship, if you're even trying to enter into a relationship with that type of person, it's kind of uncertain. Because like one day they're telling you one thing, and the next day they're telling you something different. And then one day they're telling you one thing. I don't know about you, but I have a difficult time even wanting to go into a relationship with that type of person because I never know what they're going to do. Y'all, anybody know anybody in here like that? You have people in your life that, that just, it's, it's all shaky. Shaky ground. Their word means nothing. We ought to be a people, if we're living and walking in absolute truth, that our word means something. It's just like, we say what we say. We do what we're going to do. We say what we're going to do come hell or high water. Amen. Amen. We ought not have a plan B. Do you know God doesn't have a plan B? God's always got plan A because it's, he's absolute. He's absolute. We ought to be the same way. We ought to have plan A and plan A only. Amen. Bible go, if we're going to continue to look on here, just I broke the word up. The, or the, the, the saying up, or the phrase absolute truth, and broke it up but using the word absolute. Absolute, the word absolute is free from imperfection. Wow. It's complete. It's perfect. It's pure. Uncontaminated. Having no restrictions, no limitations. Truth. Def, one definition of truth is conformity with fact or reality. When I read that, I thought, wow, that's really cool because our reality needs to be the reality of heaven. Yeah. I know this is difficult. We've been preaching on this, dabbling a little bit here and there over probably the past year, year and a half. But this, this, uh, this realm that we call uh, life or the world or the natural realm that we function in every day, do you know this is not reality? And when I say it's not reality, yes, we live in it, yes, we function in it, but it's not God's reality for us. God's reality is kingdom reality. Kingdom reality butts up against natural reality, and it, it, it doesn't mix, it doesn't jive. That's why all through our scriptures you'll see things in the promises of God, or you'll see things that God says about his reality, kingdom reality, and it causes you to go... Like in Proverbs, it says, give, give money away and you'll get more. Keep it and you'll go broke. 
That doesn't line up with, our with the world's reality. The world's reality is, is prepare for retirement, have a huge savings account, save all the everything that you can get, man. And there's nothing wrong with saving. There's nothing wrong with having retirement program. There's nothing wrong with any of that, understand. But it doesn't line up with Scripture. In the sense of meaning that no matter what you're saving, if at any given time God says, uh, I want you to give that away. If we're all honest with ourselves, especially if it's our savings, we'll go, God, I'll give anything away but that because that's my savings. But God is saying, no, I need you to give away. Why? Because he wants to give you more. Well, that doesn't make sense, does it? It doesn't line up with our natural way of thinking. So we've got to change our reality. And our reality needs to be a kingdom reality. Now, I'm going to share uh, uh, some scriptures here in Colossians, Colossians chapter 3. Many of you, you, you've heard these scriptures before because I share them a lot. I'll share them on Wednesday nights. I share them in our Tuesday class. I, I share it in my Sunday morning messages at different times because it's talking about reality in the New Living Translation, I believe. My opinion is that it, it, it's sometimes the clearest with what God is trying to say here. But in Colossians chapter 3, and you don't need to put it up on the screen because it'll just... My, my New Living Translation is the original when they wrote the New Living, and then they tweaked it a little bit after that, and it, it still is good, but I want you to just listen to what the New Living Translation here says that I've got in a New Living Translation, Colossians chapter 3. It says, since you've been raised to new life, meaning since you've been born again, since God raised you to a new standard of life, and this life is the absolute truth, the absoluteness of his word. It says, since you've been raised to new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven. There's got to be a shift that takes place when we get born again. There's got to be a shift in our thinking when we come into relationship with Christ. And Paul is telling the church at Colossae exactly what that shift is. Since you've been raised to new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven, where Christ sits at God's right hand in the place of honor and power. Let heaven fill your thoughts. You get born again, you're supposed to now let heaven or let the kingdom of God God's way of living, God's way of truth, God's word of truth, you've got to begin to let this fill your thoughts. See, and we live in a, in a world where that's a great challenge right now to even operate in absolute truth or anything that's absolute because everything is changing. I mean, my gosh, you can buy, you can buy a computer today and next week they've got something new and great out. It's obsolete already. I'm a firm believer that what they're selling you is already obsolete, and they know that. But it changes that fast. Technology is just boom, boom, boom. So to set our sights on the things of heaven, to be able to let heaven fill our thoughts, that's a challenge. It takes an effort, a concerted effort to say, no, I'm not going to buy into I mean, mainstream media right now with everything that's going on in our nation with the COVID-19 and the protesting and everything else, the stuff that's going on in China. And I mean, we, we've got to be very careful about how much we allow to be bombarded with. It's just like it's coming at us constantly, a barrage. So to let heaven fill your thoughts, it's challenging. And the only way you're going to let heaven fill your thoughts is you've got to be more conscious of heaven than you are of this arena. <laughs> and without going into that message right now, we'll go into uh, in the weeks to come, is we've got to know our identity. You've got to know who you are. You are a spirit functioning on this world. You simply have a body, and that body gets you around on this earth. That's all it is, is your car. It's your vehicle. It's your mode to get you around while your time here on earth is being fulfilled, 
or God is fulfilling His purpose through your life. How many of you, when you came to church this morning, the car didn't drive you, you drove the car? At least I hope. <laughs> it's kind of scary. I could probably ask you, Nathan, with, with Lexus, they're, they're, they're getting closer to closer to cars driving you, aren't they? To some extent. That's scary. I'd much rather have somebody driving the car than the car driving them. Because if something goes wrong with the sensor, or something goes wrong, now you've got an unmanned vehicle. Well, you know, there's a lot of people in the world that are living unmanned. Because the real man is you on the inside. And if you're letting your body do whatever you want it to do, or the body's going where it wants to go, and wants to get involved in what it gets, wants to get involved in, and wants to do whatever feels good, come on, is living outside of the absolutes of God's word, guess what? It's an unmanned vehicle. Come on, we ought not live as unmanned vehicles. We're in control of the ship. We tell the vehicle it goes over here. We tell the vehicle if it goes over there. The vehicle doesn't tell us. But many times that's exactly what happens is we fall outside of the realm of absolute truth and the vehicle says, well, hey, I think I should go over here. And we just go along with it. And then we wonder why we get in trouble. Or we wonder why things don't turn out quite right. It's because truth that lives on the inside of us, where Pastor Dina shared last week, truth that lives on the inside of us, the spirit of truth, John chapter 16, verse 13, Jesus said, I'm going to send the spirit of truth, the Holy Spirit. And that spirit of truth, if you go on reading that scripture, it says that the spirit of truth will lead you. Well, the spirit of truth has to have some cooperation from us. Come on. He wants to lead you, but if you're not cooperating, it takes cooperation. Cooperate. See, absolute truth is only absolute in our lives, is only definite and absolute if we cooperate with it. We must cooperate with it. How many know you've got to cooperate with gravity? If you don't think you have to, let's go outside. Anybody here that doesn't think you have to, and I'll let you climb up on the roof, and then you just walk off the edge. Make the choice not to cooperate with absolute. But even in that, it's absolute in the natural. It's not an absolute with God. You say, well, how could that be? We see it in the scripture. Peter walked on water. Gravity would not allow you to walk on water. But God's absolute truth supersedes natural law. God has placed natural laws in the earth. Yes, that is true. But they even have to, they have to bow to the absolute of God's authority. They have to bow to the absolute of God's character. They have to bow to the absolute of the creator of the natural law. You know, God created the natural laws. And if he created them, if God says so, they have to bow to, his create, to what he created. They have to. That's absolute. Now, I'm not telling you go walk on water unless God tells you to walk on water. We don't see anywhere else in the Bible that anybody walked on water. The only reason why Peter did is because God, through Christ, the Son of God, told Peter, come. He got the command. The moment Jesus said, come, the absoluteness of God, of creation, went into effect, and it superseded natural law. That's the absoluteness of truth. So don't think you can just go out there, get in a boat to go out on the ocean today and go, well, bless God, I'm just going to take it for a little run. <laughs> now, if God didn't tell you, it ain't going to go well. <laughs> I'm just telling you, man. But if God tells you, if you hear the spirit of truth, because, see, that's who we're listening, we should be listening to now. Well, just turn with it. Hang on, hang on. I'm going to finish Colossians. I'm getting ahead of myself here. Colossians chapter 3. Whew. It says, Let heaven fill your thoughts. Do not think only about things down here on earth. For you died when Christ died. I'm back in Colossians 3.1. Got out ahead of myself. I need to finish this. 
For you died when Christ died, and your real life, say my real life. My real life. Your real life. See, your real life is the spirit life. Your real life is now the life that's connected to God. Yes. Your real life is the born again life. Yes. Yes. That's your real life. It says, for you died when Christ died, and your real life is hidden with Christ and God. And when Christ, who is your real life, is revealed to the whole world, you will share in all his glory. Our real life is in Christ. In Christ. The Bible said in John chapter 15, verse 7, Jesus says, if you abide in me and I abide in you, you'll ask whatever you will, and it'll be done for you. If you abide. I said, if you abide, Jesus said, if you abide in me, what does that mean? That means you're living in the truth. Yeah. You're living in the truth. You're not living in a fantasy world. Or you could, I could say, you're not living in a virtual reality. Yeah, there it is. Many of us in here are probably familiar with virtual reality because with all the games that are out there right now and Samsung has this, these goggles you can put on that gives you a virtual reality and it creates such a reality or a, a, a sense of reality that you can be watching this thing. If, you've, if any of you have ever tried them, they're just crazy. You put them on and you're looking at this thing and next thing you know you're going. And there ain't nothing going on. You're standing right there on solid ground just the whole time just like you were before you put them on. But pretty soon you're swaying. You're going like this, it's like, whoa, whoa. It's a virtual reality. This life is now to us as believers is a virtual reality. It's a virtual reality. So I looked that up. I'm going to get over to John chapter 16 here in a minute. I didn't forget. Virtual reality. To get the full understanding of what virtual reality is, you've got to break it down. The word virtual just simply means near. Reality is what we experience as human beings. Or you could say virtual reality is something that is near reality. It's false. It gives you a sense of real. How many know that's what counterfeit is? It's not real, but it sure looks real, smells real, feels real. To the naked eye, it looks real. That's why to be able to function and operate in the absolute truth of God's word, we can't look with these natural eyes. We can't go to the word of God with our five physical senses because it won't make sense or it will seem like it can't be done. Come on. We've been taught in this world or in this arena that we call life what truth is. When in fact most, and I'm not talking about, you know, two plus two equals four, stuff like that. I'm talking about spiritual realities versus natural realities. What we've been taught in this world is not necessarily true. And to undo the things that we've considered true, we have to be, have one that is called the spirit of truth. Yeah. Now you can turn over to John chapter 16. Who's there? A couple of people raised their hands. I'm not even there yet. John chapter 16, verse 13. Just for the sake of time, this is really Jesus is talking about the Holy Spirit. Chapter 14, 15, and 16 is talking about him sending the Holy Spirit. But John chapter 16 and verse 13, specifically, it says here, When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not be presenting his own ideas. He will be telling you what he has heard. The reason why God's 
Jesus said that I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit is because we needed the spirit of truth to come and live on the inside of us. One that would only speak the truth to our spirits so that we could then line up with and know what the truth is. Because Jesus knew that humanity living without him lived in, an, in a virtual reality, you could say. Lived in something that seemed true, that was close to the truth. But how many know something that's close to the truth and absolute truth are two different things? So to be able to come out of a virtual reality or to come out of a way of thinking that was not the truth of God's word or the truth of God's plan for humanity, for his creation. See, nobody, nobody ever knew other than Adam and Eve what it was like to walk with God. The way God intended. And when they messed up, absolute truth went out the door. Because God basically said, all right, you, you, you don't want to live underneath my guidelines. You don't want to live in the realm of absolute truth. Now you're going to have to try and figure this thing out for yourself. And man lived like that up until Jesus came. And then Jesus came, who is truth. We already know the Bible says that he is the truth. Jesus came as truth to show you what truth looked like. See, we've got to understand, when it says, I met absolute truth, we met the one, if you're born again, you have met the one that is truth. So what he looks like to you, what he says to you, what he did while he was in the earth, that is the picture of truth. So the picture of truth means that when hands are laid on somebody, they recover. The real truth is, is when somebody is being oppressed by the devil or is possessed by the devil, you walk up and you can cast that devil out. That's right. The real truth says that if you're baptized in the spirit, you'll speak with new tongues, which means there'll be a new language. And that really is in two arenas if you think about it. Because we not only speak a new language with our English language, meaning we start speaking the truth of words God, but then you get baptized in the Spirit according to the book of Acts, chapter 2, chapter 8, chapter 10, chapter 19, multiple places where they were filled with the Spirit of God began to speak in a different language. You actually get a new language besides that you can activate anytime you choose to and speak out the perfect will of God. Amen. That's a whole other teaching itself. I'm not going to go down there. I could get off. You understand that there is truth that came to live on the inside of us. And that truth is now to help us change or shift our way of thinking. When we got born again, we have to do a paradigm shift into what truth, what we think truth is. Because not everything that we see is true. Not everything we hear in this world is true. Some things are. Some things line up with the principles of God's word. But there's many things that do not. And we've got to be wise enough to be able to identify those things that are not truth and not slip into the trap that much of the world slips into. And unfortunately, much of the church slips into. The word or the absolute truth of God's word has to become more than just mental assent or mental knowledge. Because if all it is is mental assent or mental knowledge, it becomes doctrine. I don't know about you, but I just don't want another doctrine that I can go around and quote. I can parrot others that say it, but there's absolutely no effect in my life. Because when you walk in absolute truth, it will affect every arena of your life. It'll affect, it'll affect your physical body. It will affect your finances. It will affect your relationships. It will affect your marriages. It will affect your, your job and the people that you work with. It will have an effect. Truth simply is light. Truth simply is light coming into a situation. How many know when you bring light into darkness, it has an effect? Yes. That is a truth that can't be changed. 
James chapter 1 and verse 17 says that with God, there is no shadow of turning. Well, let's turn over there and take a look at it. I get too used to just quoting scriptures and not going to them, but it's good for you to see them in the word yourself. On your phone, on your tablets, in your Bibles, whatever you've got. Chapter 1, verse 17 of James says, and I said this earlier even, it says, whatever is good and perfect comes to us from God above, who created all heaven's lights. Unlike them, the never changes. He never changes or casts shifting shadows. God is perfect life or is absolute light. Yeah. Or you could say absolute truth. He is absolute light. The glory of God is absolute all the way around him. No matter how you look at him, no matter how you approach him, no matter what angle you come from to him, God will never cast a shadow. That's how absolute the light of God is. So when you begin to understand that you are the light of God now, you are the glory of God in the earth, we're not to cast a shadow. We're not to cast a shadow. Now, how many know that we're all a work in progress? Amen. We're all a work in progress. So there are areas in our life that... And that's only because we've not seen the truth the way God sees it. That's why it's good to pray the Ephesian prayers over our lives. That the eyes of our understanding would be enlightened. Because I don't know about you, I don't want to cast shadows. I want the glory of God in my life to not cast, so there's no shadows cast in my life. So I'm walking in the fullness of the glory of God. But you've got to be, like I said in Colossians chapter 3, you've got to begin to start thinking outside of the box. See, when Adam and Eve messed up in the earth, they put themselves in a box to have to do and figure out life for themselves. Then when Jesus, the way, the truth, the life came into the earth and to put your trust in him, he's... It says, actually, the scripture says that he tore the veil in two, or he released himself into the earth. He released the glory of God into the earth. He released the light of the glory of God into the earth. And that light and the glory was to rest upon us as we received Christ. Which means he released us, or you could say that the, we, we're no longer in a box. When we don't adhere to the absolute truth of God's word, we think, or the thought is in the world, with there being no absolute truth, that we're free. That's what people would tell you about, you know, no absolute truth, because then it's, you can do what you want, you can go where you want, everything. That's true freedom. No absolute truth is freedom. When you don't have absolute truth is when you box yourself in back to the way Adam and Eve was because now you're trying to figure out life on your own. But absolute truth is actually what frees you up because now you don't have to figure out life on your own. You don't have to do life by yourself. Now you've got absolute truth who is the Holy Ghost living on the inside of you, directing and guiding and leading your life and only speaking the words from truth. <laughs> See how easy God made it for us. He made it so easy. He said, I'm going to come and live on the inside of you. Truth is going to live right here on the inside of you. I'm going to take up residence. Aren't you glad that truth took up residence in you? Amen. He said, you're not going to have to try and figure this thing out anymore. You put your trust in my son who is truth. I'm going to send the one that is truth to live on the inside of you to lead you into truth. And I'm only going to speak the words that come from truth. I mean, how much more truth do we need? Sounds pretty absolute, doesn't it? He's like, if you can't get it just by accepting that Jesus is the truth, when you accept the truth, I'm going to send the truth. And that truth is going to come and live on the inside of you. When he comes and lives on the inside of you, he's only going to speak truth to you. And while he's speaking truth to you, it's going to be real easy to be led to the truth because he's going to be speaking the truth.
I've been saved now for 30 years, and some of the basic things that I'm sharing with you today, as I was even preparing for this, I'm realizing, man, I've, I've made it hard sometimes. When I've had truth living right on the inside of me, and I'm still, how many have ever done it? You're still trying to figure things out for yourself. And God's just like, why, why are you doing that? I gave you truth to trust in. I, then, I, then I came, I, I let truth come and live on the inside of you. And then I let the truth from heaven be spoken so that the truth that's living on the inside of you can speak the same thing, the truth that, that he's hearing from heaven. And then while he's speaking it to you, he's also going to say, uh, come this way because this is where the truth is manifested over here. Why don't you come on with me? And we're just like, no, I don't know about that. I, I don't know if I'm going to buy into that absolute truth thing. I think, I think. I'm still going to try to figure this thing out for myself. You know, John Wesley said that the scriptures were given to instruct the church and judge the church. The church was never meant to judge the scriptures. John Wesley said that. John Wesley said the scripture was given to judge the church. And I don't want you to go down judges a negative, you know, judgment type thing. But the scriptures were given to judge the church. Meaning the scriptures were given to point out to us whether or not we're walking in absolute truth. The church was never meant to judge absolute truth or judge the scripture. Man, when I read that, I thought to myself, Lord, forgive me. How many times have I went at the word of God judging the word of God? It's like, whoa. Judging if that's true. Here's someone preaching the word and saying, and I'm judging if that's true. No, the scripture is true. Their interpretation of it may not be true. Understand, you can judge the interpretation, yeah. but when you hear the scripture, you better say, uh, yeah, that's true. <laughs> Amen. Now, the interpretation of it, well, sometimes, even the interpretation in some of the new translations, we have to go, well, maybe sometimes, I don't know. But the world is filled with, with no such thing as absolute truth. The colleges, I'm sure, Will, you've experienced that just finishing up with college. But in psych classes and all the philosophy classes, they, they try to tell you there, there is nothing absolute. You think about the craziness of that statement. Well, there is no such thing as absolute. Well, you sound pretty absolute about your telling me there's nothing absolute. <laughs> how, how does that work? If there's no absolute truth, then you telling me there's no absolute truth must not be absolute. Kind of shoots down your theory, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. Are you absolutely sure there's no absolute truth? You sure about that? Can't be if you're telling me there's nothing absolute. That means it's just a theory. It's just a thought. It's just something I came up with. Jesus said in John 18, 37, he's talking to Pilate here. I have come into the world to testify of the truth. This is just before Jesus is going to the cross. And he tells Pilate, because Pilate is challenging him right now. Jesus said, I've come into the world to testify of the truth. Well, you think about what that says there. If we're... If we're going to believe in absolute truth and Jesus tells us that we're to be witnesses or testify of him, Jesus didn't say that he came into, that's not saying that he came into the world just to talk about the truth. Because we know Jesus' life and ministry, he just didn't talk. He demonstrated. He testified. Which means he was the witness of the truth. He was the evidence, or you could say, of the truth. He talked about it, then he demonstrated it. He talked about it, then he demonstrated it. This ought to challenge all of us if we say we believe in absolute truth. Now I'm not saying that you don't, but there may be, you may be limited in what you believe with regards to absolute truth, because if you have absolute truth functioning and working in your life, you ought to be able to demonstrate it to some degree.
You ought to be testifying of it, not just in word, but in deed. Jesus even said that. If you don't believe the words that I say, you've got to at least believe what I'm doing. Which means there was both things happening in Jesus' life. Jesus was testifying of the truth through his words and through his deeds. And he challenged the Pharisees. Man, if you don't believe it, because they, they wanted to stone him. They wanted to kill him. And Jesus said, hey, what are you going to kill me for? For the good deeds? Or you could say, for the absolute truth of God's character and word and love being demonstrated? Is that what you're going to kill me for? The absoluteness of who the Father is and what he represents? See, there's a lot of people in the world, they don't want anything to do with God because they're not seeing absolute truth. They're seeing religion. Religion is far from absolute truth. They're seeing doctrine. People are going to church every single day, every Sunday, and, and hearing a bunch of doctrine, a bunch of knowledge, and they're receiving it as knowledge. But they're not experiencing absolute truth. And they grow weary in just receiving knowledge. And then pretty soon they don't want anything to do with the church or they don't want anything to do with God because they're not experiencing absolute truth. God intended for us to experience Him. Jesus intended for us to experience Him. He wanted us to experience the truth. Not just talk about the truth, but to experience the truth. And if all you're doing is gaining knowledge of the truth, but not walking in the truth, experiencing the truth, what that does is it's just the traditions and doctrines of man. And the Bible tells us, I believe it's over in Mark chapter 7, it says that the traditions and the doctrines of man means just man's idea of truth, or man just talking about the truth and trying to build a doctrine around it and a tradition around the truth, their idea of what they think God said. Absolute truth means you just look at the word and you take what the word says as truth. But the Bible tells us that the traditions and the doctrines of man render the word of God powerless. Well, if we know that the word is Jesus incarnate, it renders the power, the authority of God powerless. God wants his truth to be more than just head knowledge. Wants it to be more than just a bunch of people, his children walking around quoting scripture, but he wants them to experience it. And then as they experience it, shed the light without shadow of turning into somebody else's life and help them experience it. We, if we know the truth, we ought to be helping somebody else experience the truth. Truth is a person. It's not just a thought. It's not just an idea. It's not just a theology. It's not just a doctrine. It's not just a good way of thinking. It is a person. It is a lifestyle. It is a way to live. It is something to experience day in, day out, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 365 days a year. That's the purpose of truth. But there can be no shadow of turning with it. Because if there's shadow of turning, we go into what the world talks about truth is, which is relative truth, meaning it works this way in this situation, but it doesn't work the same way in this situation. No, God works the same way in every situation. He may use different avenues to work his truth, but the result is going to be his truth. The result is always going to be the same. And if we're not getting God results, then we're not operating in God's truth. Amen. Jesus said in John chapter 10, verse 35, you can go read John chapter 10 to get the full context, but Jesus said in John 10, 35, says the scriptures cannot be broken or cannot be altered. They cannot be altered. We cannot make the word of God or the Bible say what we want it to say 
or alter it or adjust it. Jesus was saying through all of time. Because he remember the Bible says that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He doesn't change. That's why Jesus said in John 10, 35, they cannot be altered or they cannot be broken. Even if man attempts to break them. Even if man attempts to alter them. It's the only book that has ever endured the things that it has endured since the beginning of time that has not been altered. Yes, I'm, I'm not talking about people don't try to put inter come out with different interpretations and everything, but the gist of the Bible, the heart and the core of the Bible cannot be altered, and it never has been altered. There are still original manuscripts that you can go back to. There are Greek lexicons and, and Hebrew word studies and everything that you can go back to to get the full. That's why it's sad sometimes in some of our modern translations, if, if you want to be a student of the word and just study a little bit, get yourself a Greek lexicon, get yourself a book on the Hebrew saying, and, and look up some of the words, because, man, they put our English saying, the vernacular that we use and the definition on words that we use today, they try to attach it, and it completely loses the absoluteness of what God was signed, trying to say. That's the whole reason why the, the New Testament was written in Greek, because at that time, the Greek language was the most absolute, most accurate language there was at that time to interpret the words that Paul was trying to say and communicate through his letters. Man, and if you've never done that, I encourage you, go get a Greek lexicon. Go get a Greek concordance. And when you find certain words that you just know that you know you know the meaning in, a, in our regular language, in our English language, and then go look it up in the Greek and you go, oh my gosh, that's not what it means at all. That's why they say the King James, even though I don't preach much out of the King James, she does more than I do, it's still after 30 years, man, the King James is hard for me. You get all the these and the thous and the thuses. And <laughs> I'm like... I don't speak King James Elizabethan. It twists my head all up. <laughs> I like some of the more new modern translations. And if I see, and I still know the King James. I mean, I study out of it. I just don't preach out of it. And, and, but I, there's some things in the new translations I'll look at, and it's just like, no, nah, they're, they're missing something here. They're missing something here. And I'll go back to the King James, and then from the King James, I'll look at some of the original texts, if you can find them and the definitions of the words, and, and uh, even the King James, they don't quite get it 100% right, but they say it is, for the Bible, one of the most accurate that we have, for absolute, to be absolute what God is trying to say. But we need to understand that the God's, the inerrancy of God's word, I mean that there's no fault in it. Just the, the simplicity of, of what the word inerrant means. It says the Bible is without fault or error. That's what the word inerrancy means. The, we have to, as believers, it, to believe absolute truth, that we have to believe that when we go to this book, it is without error. It is without fault. And because of the way we're trained in society before we were born again, is we're trained to have doubt. The world is it's just good at it. trains us to doubt. You know, well, are you sure about that? Can you really put your trust in that? I mean, you hear it. I'm sure anybody that's ever shared the scriptures with anybody or tried to share Jesus Christ, share the Bible with anybody, they'll, the first thing that most of them will say, well, that was just written by a bunch of men. How do you know that what they put down on paper is right? Well, if that's the case, then how can you put your trust in any history book or anything that you learn? Because if you weren't alive during the time, it's all fake if you've got that mentality. Because I wasn't living 100 years ago, so anything that happened 100 years ago before I was born, it must be fake because man just wrote it down, you know. Maybe World War I really didn't happen. I wasn't alive during it. Maybe there's somebody's just trying to fool me that there was a war. Maybe, maybe we really don't have a constitution. I wasn't around in 1776 when they say these men came together. How do I even know there was a George Washington? Just because somebody wrote it down in a book. Well, man just wrote that down. He never existed, which means the document never existed. I mean, you think about when people th say stuff like that. 
But that's the enemy trying to, the enemy is the one that fights absolute truth. Religion and doctrine of men and everything, the sole purpose of the enemy working through religion and doctrine of men and different religions and everything is to get someone to not accept the truth. Because once you accept the truth, meaning Christ, now the truth comes to live on the inside of you. And he's got a lot bigger fight on his hands once truth comes to live on the inside of you. And it also means that he gets kicked out. Because he's the father of lies. He told, he, Jesus told the Pharisees, you're of your father the devil, the father of lies. When you get born again, you're no longer a child of lies. And if you're no longer a child of lies, that means you're a child of truth. And if we're a child of truth, we ought to put our trust in the truth. And we ought to speak the truth. We ought to live in the truth. We ought to be led by the truth. The absoluteness of God's word. There's nothing like it. Aren't you glad that you've got a foundation to stand on? Something that's not shaky. Think about all the people out in the world all, every single day that everything that they want to put their trust in tomorrow could be different because someone comes along, progressive thinking, comes along and says, well, that's not true anymore. It's just like, well, man, I've, I've stood on that for years. Now you're telling me it's not true anymore. But as believers, children of God, we've got something that is solid and firm. We can stand on it come hell or high water. We can stand on it through the storm. We can stand on it through sickness. We can stand on it through lack. We can stand on it in difficult times. We can stand on it in good times. We can stand on it when we don't know what's around the corner. We can stand on it knowing that even though we don't know what's around the corner, I'm standing on it. When I come around the corner, boom, it's all going to be good. Because in God, it turns out good every time. You say, well, I don't know about that because I've stood on God's word sign and it didn't seem like it turned out very good. Well, if you're really believing in the truth, what's the end game? You win. And you go to spend time with him. So it's always good. Don't base what's good upon you, what you might encounter in this realm, in this arena of life. Base that you know, that you know, that you know when it's all said and done. It'll be na 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 boo boo on you. I'm going to heaven. And you're not. Absolute truth. Absolute truth. We're going to continue over the next several weeks, begin to talk about absolute and the absolutes of God's word. Picking out those absolute things. Talking about you are the righteousness of God. Well, that's absolute. You are the healed of God. That's absolute. You are the blessed of God. That's absolute. You are born again. That's absolute. All the things that God says that you are, all the things that God says you can have, all the victories that Jesus won for you, that's now. That's absolute. That's not I hope it will be. The unfortunate thing is, is the church, in many churches, that because they've not experienced the truth for themselves, they push the truth off as, well, that's a truth that is to come. No, Jesus didn't say that. Jesus said that I want you to live heaven on earth. Means what is truthful and absolute in heaven is truthful and absolute here on earth. What is a lie in heaven and isn't allowed in heaven is a lie here on the earth. It's not absolute here on the earth. Amen. So we'll be looking at those things. What are absolute and what do they really mean? I just want to challenge them. We're going to be, I'm going to be challenging. I'm sure Pastor Dina will be sharing this with me, talking about different things. But I want to challenge you in the things that you say you believe. And I'm not saying that you don't believe them. But I just want to challenge your thinking. I want to challenge the way you've looked at the Word of God. I want to challenge you the absoluteness and how you've looked at the Word and has it, is it absolute to you or have you wavered? The Bible talks many places about wavering. I want to challenge you in those areas. How absolute is it? 
when you're actually backed up, when your back is against the wall? Is it absolute that when the Bible says when you've done everything to stand, stand? That's absolute. When you know that you know that you know what the Word says and you've done everything you know that the Word says to do and it doesn't seem like anything's changing, but you're going to stand anyways. Or do we have a handlebar over here to grab onto? Do we walk in faith to the point where we jump out beyond ourselves to where we can't grasp back on? To where there's nothing to grab onto? A.W. Tozer said, I've shared this with you guys recently. A.W. Tozer said, this was a gentleman back from around 1850, 1860. A.W. Tozer said, real faith is where you step out and there's no turning back. And I'm not saying I'm there. I'm not looking at you this morning saying that's where I'm at. You need to get there. There's times where it's been faith in my life and it's just like you step out just far enough. But if you have to reach out, you still got that safety thing to grab on. It's like, whew. Oh, it was tough out there, man. I thought I was going down. Real faith is when you're just like, no matter what you do, you can't reach it. You're either going under or you're going over. And all of us should be attaining to that place. I'm not saying I'm there. And my guess is you probably ain't there either. But you know what? The absolute truth will get us there. The more solid we become in that foundation, the more absolute the word of God becomes to us, we'll get to those places in our life where it's just like, I don't need that. Because I know my God. The absoluteness of his word and his truth. Amen. That's where God wants us. That's why he gave us the truth. That's why he sent truth to live on the inside of us. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Father, we thank you. We thank you. The absoluteness of your word. 